feed your head, engage your brain, and enter the mind's eye. Your one-stop shop for politics to paranormal and everything in between. I'm your humble host, DJ BJ Turnoff, and you're listening to The Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio. I, I woke up this morning from the most intense dream I've had in a while. I woke up and my whole bed was wet. It's not that type of dream, you, you sickos, but... The dream felt so real. It felt as if I was living and breathing every moment of it and reflecting upon it all day. I honestly haven't really been able to come up with a freaking clue what it means. Quite frankly, scientifically speaking, we don't really know the function or functions of dreaming. But in recent years, luckily, dreams are slowly being reintroduced into the medical arena. One such medical man, Dr. Larry Burt, founding member of the American Board of Scientific Medical Institution and a former board president of the Rhine Research Center. He's going to stop on by to share his amazing research into the important role of dreams and their medically validated power to detect illnesses. Dr. Burke's amazing research is featured in the book, Dreams That Can Save Your Life, Early Warning Signs of Cancer and Other Diseases. The book is also co-authored by one of the study participants, Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis, who will be coming by with the good doctor as well. Kat's going to talk about her incredible story of triumph as a three-time breast cancer survivor. Kat is going to talk about her incredible story of triumph as a three-time breast cancer survivor who credits that survival partially to her precognitive dreams that diagnosed her cancer even when the doctors missed it. In just a few minutes, you're going to hear how life can go from a fantasy to a nightmare real quick and how the power of dreams can help you get back to the reality you want and the health you need. This is The Mind's Eye. Welcome back to The Mind's Eye, and you better not sleep on this episode and our two upcoming guests, but you also better not sleep on the future of technology and its impact on this world, good or bad. That's why I want you to meet Norman, the psychopathic artificial intelligence Norman is an artificial intelligence algorithm created by MIT as part of an experiment to see what training AI on data from the dark corners of the net would do to its worldview. Let's just say that Norman doesn't particularly have a positive view of the world. Let me tell you the difference between what a normal algorithm sees as opposed to what Norman sees. Two examples, when given an abstract shape to look at, a normal AI will see something like a group of birds sitting on top of a tree branch. Norman sees a man being electrocuted, where a normal AI sees a picture of people standing next to each other. Norman sees a man jumping from a window. Are you scared yet? Well, we have to think about what does this tell us? It, it tells us that data matters. Data matters to MIT. It also matters to CIT, where two years ago, two planetary scientists argued that a planet is hiding somewhere in our solar system way past Pluto. The two planetary scientists made their argument for Planet Nine based on the weird orbits of a group of distant worlds. Two years later, just now, a few days ago, astronomers have spotted another distant world whose orbit is quite odd, like predicted by those two CIT scientists. What does finding a ninth planet mean? What are some of the other terrible things that the psychopathic AICs. Get the answers now on our social media pages. You can go to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's all at Minds Eye Show. Again, at Minds Eye Show. Or just go to our website, themindseyemedia.com. Again, themindseyemedia.com. I bet those two planetary scientists right now are reveling in the dreams that are finally coming true for them. Yours can come true too, and they might even just save your life. We'll be right back with Dr. Larry Burke and Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis talking about dreams that can save your life. This is The Mind's Eye. Taking us on our guided tour tonight of inner space, we have Dr. Larry Burke and TV radio host producer, uh, Nautilus Award winning author Kathleen Cannabis. Welcome to The Mind's Eye tonight, both of you. Truly, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to hear. All right. So um, as you guys, as we talked before, you guys know I have a dream journal that I've been keeping for the past six years. So, you know, I take this pretty seriously. And I'm going to 
splash in a few questions tonight as we go out through the session. But I think the best place to start right now is to say that scientifically speaking, we still don't really know why we dream. And you're both coming from it at different angles. So I want to get your opinions. Doctor, professionally, scientifically, why do we dream? Uh, yeah, uh, there's obviously still uh, a lot of research to be done on that area, but uh, I like to look at the continuity of uh, dreams during during the night to give us some clues, and that the early dreams we have just after going to sleep often have some residue from the day, from the day, and there's some uh, neuroscience to suggest that the brain is doing some house cleaning in the early part of the night, and then the deeper we go into the night, closer to morning. It seems to me that we get deeper into the subconscious mind and into the world of right brain processing and intuition. And if you look at it from the brainwave point of view, you have uh, beta, normal waking consciousness, uh, alpha in meditative state, then dipping into theta, which is as we're falling asleep or waking up, and then also dipping in and out of that during REM sleep as well, the state where you get a lot of vivid, vivid imagery. And then there's also gamma, which seems to be correlated with uh, lucid dreaming or breakthrough aha moments in, in waking consciousness. And then we also have sort of those liminal states but between uh, waking and sleeping and also even the world of daydreaming where we dip in and out of various sort of trance states. So... That's a little bit of background on that perspective. Do you think that, doctor, that it's just our mind getting junk out, or do you think that it serves an actual purpose? I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about the diagnostic, but outside of that, do you think, to me, uh, dreams are, you know, it's like a window into our soul. It's almost like a, a reflection of our things that we desire, that we need, or, or even the opposite. I mean, dreams kind of show how we truly feel about a situation. Would you agree with that? But yeah, I would say that the the left brain filter tends to go offline when we go to sleep, and the right brain can come out to play. And, and what the right brain's interested in is making sense of what's happened in the past and also predicting the future. So that some people think that dreams are a rehearsal for what's going to come next. So I kind of like that perspective because I've had a lot of precognitive dreams. I definitely want to get into that, but. Kathleen, what, what do you think about this? Why, why do we dream? Well, I think that um, we were born with the ability to, to dream. It's an innate gift that we come back with. And on a physical level on the earth plane, I think it's a time where we can get a break from all the stresses that are going on during the day. Um, but also it's an opportunity to work through challenges that we may have had during the day. And on another level, it's also a way for us to reconnect through those sacred dream doors into the divine and uh, reconnect with the world that we came from before we came here and to connect with our, our deceased loved ones because throughout this book, many of the dreamers who wrote stories talk about connecting with deceased loved ones. So, you know, it kind of proves that there is life after death, whether we want to believe it or, or, or not. I don't think that these dreamers, including myself, would be able to come back with the information that they come back with if there were not some truth to that. And remember, all of these dreams were, were validated by pathology reports. So dreaming at night gives us rest it puts us into the different levels of dreams that, that Dr. Larry Burke was talking about, but it also allows us to reconnect with our inner selves and uh, our family on the other side, our extended family, our tribe. You look at it, it seems like you take it from more of a, a spiritual angle. Uh, you guys, that's why I think you guys make such a great team because you got the spiritual and you got the science. And in my opinion, you really got to have one with the other. They, they, they do go hand in hand, whether we try as much to separate them. And I think that there's a place for both of them within each. And that's why I think you guys make such a, a great team. And let's talk about that team and, and, and how that started. Um, as we discuss, as we mentioned before, Dr. Bird met Kat when she agreed to participate in his groundbreaking study about precognitive dreams that diagnose breast cancer. Dr. Burt, where did the inspiration to start the dream research start? Uh, for me, it was, uh, well, I've been keeping my dream journal for 30 years. Um, 
but really didn't get deeply into dream research until two of my close friends told me about how they had breast cancer warning dreams. Both of them went in to have mammograms without having any symptoms. And in both cases, the mammograms were initially reported as normal. And, and my first friend insisted upon having an ultrasound, which found the cancer. And my other friend, who was a, a physician, uh, insisted upon looking at the mammogram again with the, with the radiologist, and they found the cancer. So um, in both cases, they were going to be sent home and told to come back a year later if it hadn't been for the persistent uh, belief in, in what the dreams had shown them. Kat, how, how did you find out about the study? Well, actually, Dr. Larry Burke uh, contacted me. My first book, Surviving Cancerland, Intuitive Aspects of Healing, was out, and he was doing research to, to find women who had had dreams that diagnosed their breast cancer, and that was basically what my whole book was about. And then we were, you know, kind of introduced by a mutual friend, Kelly Sullivan Walden, who's big into to dreaming also. And uh, then we start, we, we talked on the phone, and we decided to present together at the IASD, which is the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And they're quite active in dreams, and, and uh, they present to doctors all over the world, and their doctors presenting to doctors as well. And Dr. Larry Burke and I will be presenting again this June 17th in Scottsdale at the IASD, and the whole panel is going to be about this book and the dreamers in the book. Some of them are tra traveling long distances to be on that panel to talk about the book and their stories. Why don't you give out a little bit more information? Normally we do this at the end, but uh, give out more information about yourselves so people can look into the book while we're talking about it and, and, and look into that conference as well. That sounds phenomenal. Uh, yeah, my website uh, can be Larry Burke, MD. There's no E on the Burke, so it's just uh, D-U-R-K-M-D.com. And also on the website, you can find my TEDx talk, which got censored, uh, interesting enough. And the only place you can watch it is on my website now. So you have to click on the little X in the upper right corner of the red banner to remove it. Uh, the other place to contact us is through our Facebook page, Dreams That Can Save Your Life. And we're interested in hearing from people who have had dreams related to health and with some proof of, of what, the, what the dream revealed. You can either email me through the website or uh, post it on our Facebook page. What about you, Kat? What are, what are some of your personal information? Um, you can go to my website, which is Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis. That's K-A-N-A-B-O-S, just like cannabis you smoke, but <laughs> with a K and a V. Or you can go to the Dream, uh, the Queen of Dreams, which is a, a, a column that I, I write for. So that's the Queen of Dreams or Kathleen O'Keefe Cannabis dot com. And on my uh, website, I have a free gift. For all of your listeners today, they get my video 101 Dream Course for free. Oh, well, that is absolutely wonderful. That's very nice. You guys go get that right now. Go on the website, uh, particularly when we hit the commercial break in a few minutes. Uh, but you know what? You just, you just kind of gave me a question. So I'm going to give you a, a bit of a curveball here. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that your name rhymes with cannabis. How, how does drugs affect dreaming? Uh, let's just quickly touch on that. You know, in your uh, view, have you have you noticed any correlation between how drugs can affect dreaming? Sometimes marijuana will will, will suppress dreaming or at least dream recall. So, if you're really cultivating your uh, your dream life, it m might be best to uh, abstain at least before you go to bed. Anyway, and the uh, there are other types of supplements uh, which are called onerogens. Uh, being sort of the Greek word for, for dr agents that cause dreaming. And, and ver those have various uh, positive and negative aspects to them. Some drugs, like drugs you take for Alzheimer's, will, will have vivid, disturbing dreams as side effects. And there are other drugs that have dreams as side effects. Uh, I would also consider any nightmare that you have that's induced by drugs to be fertile ground uh, to write down your dream diary. I, I don't consider it as anything that's really a nightmare. It's just how loud does it have to get to get your attention. So, 
Well, I believe that our dreams are actually um, a, a gift in disguise, especially our nightmares. Our nightmares are always a call to action and they're really hard to forget. But when it comes to drugs and dreaming, uh, there are drugs that suppress the memory of the dream. I believe you're still dreaming, but it's hard to bring it back out of that depth that drug related depth. Um, but if it's a really, really important dream, it's amazing how our inner guidance, spirit guides, guardian angels will make sure that you remember that dream, even if it means waking you up in the middle of the night to write a dream down so you don't forget it. And that happened to me a lot while I was undergoing chemotherapy because the drugs you know, a lot, a lot of the drugs would just knock me out and my guides would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, you know, write this down, write it down now before you forget it. And so it's really important to have that available by your bed to do it. But if there's a dream that's important that you need to know information that can save your life, you know, it's going to come through to you in dreams. They, the dreams will be impossible to ignore and they will be recurring. Let's really dive into that uh, deeply now. And in the book, In Dreams That Can Save Your Life, Kat, you wrote about the precognitive dreams that, that saved your life. Mm -hmm. Share share the dreams, uh, the dream and dreams that saved your life. Uh, and, and we'll dive into that afterwards. Okay. Well, the, the, the dream that started it all <laughs> was the dream with my Franciscan monks. And, and I had gone in for my yearly uh, checkup. And it's amazing. We go in for a yearly checkup. We have no symptoms. We have no reason to go in there other than for the doctor to check us and say, yeah, you're healthy, go home. But when you go into the doctor with a symptom, which I believe dreams and nightmares are, it's like, oh, you know, that that's, you know, insane. No, we're not going to deal with that. But we'd much rather deal with nothing. <laughs> so anyhow, I went in for my, my yearly mammogram pap smear, you know, physical exam, blood test. And the doctor told me I was healthy and to go home. And that started the nightmares in which I would be having my regular dream at night. And suddenly my dream would freeze, just like your computer screen will freeze. And I got a pop-up in my dream, just like on your computer, you get a pop-up window. And that window then turned into a door and through that door walked a uh, Franciscan monk, looked like uh, St. Francis of Assisi, uh, walked through this door. And this monk said, come with me, we have something to tell you. And the monk actually led me through the doorway into what I call the room between realms. It's an area that is neither of the living nor the dead, but a place, a waiting place or an informational place where people from both sides can come to share knowledge. And this Franciscan monk took my hand, placed it on my breast and said, can you feel that? And I said, yes. And he said, that is breast cancer. You go back to your doctor and ask for a second set of tests. So over a period of three months, I kept having this recurrent dream with the monks and I would keep going back to my doctor who would give me a mammogram, blood test and physical exam and tell me I'm healthy and to go home. That he doesn't want to see me for six months or a year. And he also told me I was too young for breast cancer, didn't run in my family, and that uh, there was no reason for me to think that I had breast cancer. So finally, the last time the monks walked through before the cancer was discovered, I started crying when he walked through the door into my dream. And I said, I know why you're here, and I don't know what to do. My doctors aren't giving me any other tests, and I can't perform my own tests. And the monk reached into the sleeve of his robe and handed me this little tiny white feather. And he said, if you take this feather back with you tomorrow and use it as a sword to cut through your doctor's arguments, you'll get the test you need, which is exploratory surgery. That's the only thing that is going to show this cancer. So the next day, I went back to my doctor without an appointment and when he told me no, that he could not do exploratory surgery or any other tests because I was healthy, I imagined holding that feather in my fingers and pointing it at him. And I said, I need for you to help me. I don't know where else to go. I know something is wrong. I need exploratory surgery. So long story short, he did perform the surgery. Even when I asked, well, 
who's going to do the surgery? And he said, well, I am. You don't have cancer. Uh, and I said, well, where are you going to do it? And he said, right where you pointed. I'm just going to go right down over top of it. And it turned out I was in stage two, very aggressive breast cancer, and it was in a lymph node. I'm, I'm, I still don't understand how they were, if it's at that stage, how can they continue to miss that? <laughs> well, if you thought that was strange, almost five years later to the day, they missed nine by 11 centimeter recurrence using mammograms to watch for recurrence when it didn't show up the first cancer. And doctor, and talking with the other women in the study, would you say that's uh, a typical situation when a, a woman who's had these type of dreams and, you know, they're scared about what's going to happen, they, they, they feel this and they come to their doctors and their doctors tell them, you know what, there's nothing I can really do, even though it looks this way. I mean, is that a typical reaction from the doctors that you've seen? In the last five years, um, the mammography experts have started talking about the fact that women who have dense fibrous breasts have a harder time detecting cancers with a mammogram, and other tests like ultrasound or MRI might be uh, more, more sensitive in, in those situations. I'm not a mammography expert, but um, that does make sense to me. And there are numerous cases in the book of women who wound up not um, getting any results from the mammogram, and in some cases had to, uh, a direct biopsy like Kat did or an, another test. And one of the in inspirations for doing the study itself came from another friend of mine who had a dream, went to her, her doctor with some even some pain near her sternum. The doctor did a physical examination and declared it was just normal breast tissue and then didn't even get a mammogram. And then she died of metastatic breast cancer a few years later. So that was mm. the cautionary tale that motivated me wanting to get the word out and make sure no other woman has her dream dismissed by her doctor. So. In reading the, the book, some doctors did take it seriously when, you know, they were approached with this, you know, something, I guess, you know, out of the ordinary, that with these precognitive dreams. Some scoffed pretty immediately, um, some even condescendingly. Uh, why, why do some, do what, what explains the difference between these perspectives? Doctor, what do you think? Um, I think part of it is whether they're in the position of wanting to empower their patients or not. Uh, dreams are certainly outside the typical realm of, of expertise of most doctors. So they, they probably are quick to dismiss things they're not comfortable dealing with. And in the spirit of empowering patients and creating empowered patients, it's best, I think, to take the attitude that the patient actually often knows what's, what's wrong with them uh, on some level. And when we don't listen to their stories carefully, uh, we're not doing them a service. So, uh, and unfortunately, the art of listening to people's stories and making sense out of them has been lost. Uh, I'm on, amongst a mountain of technology in the last 20 years. Now, the nice thing about the stories in the book is that they're good examples of how you can use intuition and technology together and that the women in, in the breast project would use their intuition to guide maybe which test was the best one that's going to work. And they also use their intuition and their dream guidance to, to guide which therapies are going to work. And it could be you know, alternative therapy or a conventional therapy. So... Uh, I look at the, the stories as an example of, of true integrated medicine where you're choosing the best of both worlds. And Kat, before, mm -hmm. you, before you had these dreams that literally saved your life, how, how did you view dreams? Um, or did you take them seriously or did you not really take them seriously at all? Well, I did take them seriously if I if I really remembered them, if they stuck in my mind. Um, I took them seriously, especially if they were recurrent. I took them seriously. But I wasn't quite as much of a journaler, I don't think, as Dr. Larry Burke was. 
uh, I would, it was more that I, I would remember the dreams so clearly. It's almost like I didn't need to, to journal them. So once I was diagnosed, though, and I was on so many medications that I was walking around in a daze most of the time, I did keep a journal and I did write my dreams down in a journal because many of them had to do with helping me make um, uh, decisions on the medications to take and not take. So, uh, yes. And, and I do still journal if it's a, a dream that, that is really, um, a strong dream and I keep having it, I will journal it to find out what the message is. But a lot of people, when they say, well, I don't dream or I don't remember my dreams, maybe it's because it wasn't really something you needed to remember. Maybe you were dream working in that you were working through a problem. Maybe you were having in a relationship or at work and you can try on so many different solutions when you're dreaming. But if it's an important dream, it'll make sure that it's remembered and that you write it down so that you can go back and watch for the validation in your waking world. That's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, we, we, like, we, we know that everybody dreams, whether you remember or not, like you said. But for someone like me, who is somewhat of a fairly active dreamer, and I've been keeping a dream journal for a while, for whatever reason, over the past six months or so, I cannot remember one dream at all. I know that I'm having dreams. I know that, you know, that, that, that is happening, but I cannot remember when I wake up any of the details. Uh, so I haven't written an, an entry in six months, which, I mean, A, should I find that concerning? And, and B, why do you think that happens? Um, we'll get both your angles. Kat, why, why do you think that is? Have you ever had a period where you just didn't dream and, or remember that your dreams and, and how do you explain that? Yeah, I call them dry spells. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, sometimes you just go through dry spells. Um, there, there, there's not an, there's nothing that is of the utmost importance going on in your life, and so your inner guidance doesn't really need to speak to you or give you a lot of guidance. You're using your dreams as like a playground, as you know, Dr. Larry Burke talks about it. It's a playground where you can go and relax and do all the things, fly around, meet people, talk to people from previous lifetimes or the other side or whatever. But it's not imperative that you necessarily remember the dream um, because there is no call to action. There's nothing that you really need to do. But it is always nice to write those really interesting dreams down because they're so amusing and informative in the waking world. Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting is that a couple of the radio show hosts who have interviewed Larry and I were mentioning that when they kept our book next to their bed, they were having profound dreams, and a lot of them were not necessarily dreamers. And one of the radio show hosts said that I came to her in the dream and gave her all kinds of numbers. So she actually wants to call me back to talk about it. So, you know, if your your audience is listening and they'd like to become more active dreamers, try just putting our book next to our bed because I do believe dreaming is contagious. What about you, Larry? Do you think there's something that could explain why there could be such large gaps in remembering dreams? One of the things, some people had a dream drop for years. And I always tell people who say they don't dream, that the first step is to set the intention. And that's to get a dream diary and put it by your bed. And I think the prompt that sometimes triggers a response from the dream world is to write a question down in your dream diary that, that you want an answer to. And it usually should be something that you're mulling over during the day and a, a problem that you haven't solved yet that you're you wanting some more insight into. And then just jot that down in your journal. I usually put tomorrow's date down, and, you know, tonight's question, and then see what comes up the next morning. And you might only get a dream snippet, you know, a little image or just a word. And sometimes that's enough to start the recall process that you'll be able to reel in the rest of the dream like a fisherman reeling in a, a big catch. <laughs> and sometimes once you get in the habit of that, you'll get more than one dream a night. So uh, it, But I go for a couple of weeks and don't get any but uh, you know, seemingly meaningless stuff. And then all of a sudden I'll get a big, what I call a big dream, which I, I know has captured a, a significant snapshot into my life at, at, at the moment. So. 
Kat, you touched on something interesting before. Uh, it reminded me that when you were talking about how a host uh, had a dream of you, and it didn't sound like you were, you don't obviously were part of that dream, um, but there have been stories about how people have shared dreams, two separate people having the same dream. Um, doctor, have you ever known, has any of the people who have had precognitive dreams, particularly within the focus that you guys are on, uh, have there, have they had any shared dreams or, and if not, do you think, what's your notion on that? Do you think it's even possible? Well, I mean, there are, uh, a mother daughter team from Columbia, South Carolina, Rocio and Ampera, who did have dreams in common, they, I don't know that they were the same night, but they were both dreaming about the mother's breast cancer over a period of, of several months. Uh, both of them getting insight into blood coming from the breasts, and eventually these dreams did lead her mother to, to get to the doctor and, and get the mammogram. So, but but you do hear stories about people who in a dream group will set the intention to all dream together and, and then get back together the next day and discuss what they got. So I think it's definitely possible to have those kind of experiences. Rarely you'll hear two people tell us two sides of the same dream from a different perspective, especially if, you know, if they're in some sort of a semi-lucid state. So, uh, What about you, Kat? Have you ever had a shared dream with anybody? Um, I have them a lot. So uh, I do have one in the book, uh, toward the end of the book, where a, a, a woman called me up and said, you know, the doctors said they saw something on an MRI concerning my um, ovaries. And I want to know if it's cancerous or not cancerous. And I thought it was interesting because when I went into my sleep that night, setting that intention that I would like to get that information, my dream, my guides popped right in and they said, why do you want us to tell you? And I said, well, you know, why not? And they said, because we don't do hoops and neither do you. Hmm. And I, and they said, she's going to get the information when she goes into surgery tomorrow anyhow. So, and I said, well, you know, it would give me a lot of confidence since this seems to be the work that you want me to do. So if you give me the information now and I write it down and I tell her before she goes into surgery, then it can be validated by surgery and I'll have more confidence. And they said, okay. So they told me that her, her um, ovary was cancerous, but that the other ovary was not cancerous, but that the doctors would take it out anyhow, assuming that it would be, and that the doctor uh, would be using the wrong sutures to close her up because they had been mislabeled and that she was going to get a very bad infection. And so would all of his other patients that day. So when she popped a fever, that's what it would be from the sutures. So I gave her all that information and everything that was in the dream happened, just as she said, just just as the dream said. And and she got went to her doctor and everything was okay? She went to the doctor. She had uh ovar she had ovarian cancer. Uh when they wheeled her out of surgery and they found that it was cancerous, they turned around and wheeled her back in and took the other <sighs> ovary, which was not cancerous. And then when they closed her up, they didn't use the dissolving sutures. They used different sutures. And she came down with a very bad infection that actually affected her heart. Mm. But so did all the other patients that day. So they had the doctor had to go in and change out the sutures. Wow. Wow. That's uh, pretty unbelievable there. Jeez. Um, well, let's, let's take a quick break. I want to come back to your story and explore a lot more of it because there's so much more to unfold with the, dream that's, the dreams that saved your life, Kat. Um, let's take a quick break. We're going to come back with more of Cat's story and other stories from dreams that can save your life. This is the mind's eye. We'll be right back. We're back with the dream experts. Good doctor, Larry Burke. And we got Cat Cavanus. We're talking about Kathleen's incredible story as a three time breast cancer survivor and the dreams that saved her life. And we're going to talk about other dreams that saved other people's life. Of course. Now with your dream, Cat. It's just, we know with dreams that dream symbolism is very big. In one way, it seemed like you had kind of a combination of both symbols and um, like actual, you know, someone telling you what to do. Um, mm -hmm. In your case, the Franciscan monk, you had uh, a window that expands into a door. 
tiny white feather. These were all really important. Um, during the Yes. Mm -hmm. There were symbols that were given to me uh, to use. I mean, if you go back into uh, mythology, when you died and your um, accomplishments from your lifetime are weighed on the scale of life, they're weighed against a feather and they have to be lighter than the feather. And I didn't even realize that till I looked it up after I'd had that dream. It was a few years afterward. So our dreams speak to us in signs and symbols, and they also can speak to us in words. And sometimes they choose these multiple ways to, to talk to us so that um, we're getting it auditorily, we're, we're getting it visually, and sometimes we're given a play on words, like kicking something down the street or kicking it to the curb, or in one story, pushing up daisies if the dreamer did not pay attention to their dream. So we can get our dreams uh, given to us as recurrent dreams in different ways to be sure that we understand the message. Uh, why do you think you had a Franciscan monk? You know, why, why not a shaman? I know, <laughs> I, a good question. I, you know, um, a lot of people had uh, beautiful angels. They had animals. They had, um, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. Not that my monks aren't cool. They're pretty cool. <laughs> but <laughs> I have no idea why I have Franciscan monks but I do. And maybe it's because nobody would really want to go up, up against them. Maybe they'll pull a ruler out of one of those other sleeves and whack you on the hand or something. I don't know, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I still have them and uh, they, they are pretty stern, but occasionally they do laugh. And, and how do you explain the door, uh, the window, that expansion door? What, what, what do you think that was? That was just essentially saying to say, Hey, we're coming into like, this is very serious space. Uh, like a dream within a dream. What do you think is the importance of, of that part of it? Well, I think you're right there. I also believe that when we go into deeper dreams um, or deep, deeper rooms, there are a lot of dream movies that are out now and you can see them getting, you know, kind of just transitioning into another dream through a room, through a tunnel, through a door. And so it's a different area in the dream arena. And it's also a, a symbol or a message to you that this dream is different from the other dream. You're going into a different dream realm, so pay attention. And that's when the dream, the dream becomes very lucid. In, in Kat's case, you did have the Franciscan monk, you know, he said you have breast cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. It made it very obvious for you. But... Not every single time in precognitive dreams. I mean, they, they do tell you, but in some ways it's just sometimes symbols. Why is it sometimes do they very direct with uh, what they're trying to tell you and sometimes indirectly using symbols? Doctor, why do you think that dreams are used that way sometimes? Yeah, I think we have a whole spectrum of experiences in the book from uh, epic dreams like Cats or, or Wanda's, Wanda Birch's from her book, She Who Dreams. Uh, but we've got a number of instances of just waking up with a dream message, like a, a voice waking you up and not, it, not even a lot of imagery at all. Uh, and then there are other examples of other types of guides that come, including physicians or other healthcare professionals in white coats or Deceased family members, or those are the most common types of guides that we have encountered. And so I'm not sure why one particular person processes their information one way and another another. Uh, it's certainly one of the great mysteries of the dream world. But I think the information can get delivered in any way that's most effective. And sometimes the scarier the better, because that then people will always wake up and remember it. Why wouldn't the, you know, when you're dreaming, why wouldn't the dreams always just tell you this is what the problem is and this is how you solve it? Why, why do they have to use symbols all the time? Why can't they just be, why can't dreams just be absolutely more direct like they were in Kat's case when they needed, when she needed to know? It? Yeah, if you think about the way the right brain works, it does tend to work in images. Uh, although, obviously, 
messages are coming in voices and, and, and uh, even through kinesthetic touch, uh, uh, sometimes the, the guides actually touch the breast where, where the uh, uh, tumor is or even the dreamer's own hand touches. So I'd say just like in the waking consciousness when we've got five senses, the, there's the five senses and probably more active in, in the dream state. So uh, the simplest thing from a uh, medical point of view is always to invoke the more research is needed clause. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a ple- plead the fifth. I got you. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kat, uh, since, uh, since every, you know, you've, you're a three-time breast cancer survivor, since you know, you've been in remission, you're, you're doing fantastic. Have you had precognitive dreams since maybe outside of the medical realm? Um, I did. I actually had a, um, a precognitive dream where my pet, Baby Cakes, who took care of me while I was going through all three cancers, he's my Siamese cat, and I was very close to him. He was 26 years old. He had cancer of the tongue. Um, the vets had wanted me to put him to sleep like seven or eight years earlier than that, and I said, no, I can see in his eyes he's not ready to go. When he is, he'll let me know. And I had a dream in which my monks walked into my dream again. Uh, This time they walked through the door. They didn't bring me through the door. But one of the monks was carrying baby cakes. And he handed them to me and he said, this is going to be your last night with baby. So carry him around and hold him in your dreams all night. Mm -hmm. So I did. I carried him through all my dreams, all the dream doors. And I talked to him and I carried him. And the next morning when I woke up, I bolted out of bed and ran into the living room to check on baby. And he was fine. He walked with the other cats over. He ate a good breakfast. And so then I went off and played tennis, um, came home and Peter said, something's wrong with baby. He's fallen over. So I, I immediately dismissed the dream because it was too painful to think that it was coming true. And I said, he must have an infection. Let's take him to the vet. And we took him to the vet. And when I got there and they ran a blood test on him, the vet said, He's already halfway to heaven. Mm. All of his organs have shut down. This is his last day. So we we went ahead and, and put him to sleep at that time because he was in a lot of pain. Um, and uh, the dream had come true. And my guides warned me, maybe because they know I don't like real big surprises like that. I'm, I don't handle them well. <laughs> <laughs> so they let me know ahead of time. Why don't dreams ruin you of good things, huh? You know, like, hey, you're about to win a million dollars. Just start spending whatever you want. Why why don't we get any of that? Have you had any maybe positive uh, precognitive dreams that say, hey, you're about to win a bunch of money? No, but uh, but but I do know of precognitive dreams. Um, you know that said that the, the stock market's going to crash. Get all your money out now. Uh, that count, that <laughs> definitely counts. Lose it, so it's almost close to that. I mean, once you start talking to your spirit guides, they're on the time continuum that Einstein talked about. There is no past. There is no future. Everything is a great big now, and they know exactly what's going on, and they can hop all around that time continuum. Doctor, you mentioned before earlier that you've had a variety of precognitive dreams. Um, is there one that maybe sticks out and, you know, tell us the story behind that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I was also going to comment on the fact oh, that please. dreams must have an evolutionary advantage or we wouldn't have selected for them over, over the years in terms of thinking back to the indigenous tribes, uh, hunter-gatherer tribes. And the shaman uh, or the medicine man would have a dream about where the next buffalo herd was going to be. And the survival of the tribe may have been dependent on the skill of the dreamers in the tribe to, to be able to most efficiently use their their resources to, to get the next uh, meal. So uh, I suspect that the ability to dream, and, and that would be a, a positive guidance type of dream, would be quite useful from an evolutionary point of view. Um, But from my own uh, uh, dreams, uh, there was uh, one that happened recently, which really was a bit of a mind bender in terms of predicting the future and also having a positive message. And I dreamed one night that I was driving in a car with a woman passenger who turned to me and said, someone told me I'm going to have a near-death experience today which got my attention in in the dream. I didn't wake up. I just thought, oh, I better drive really carefully. And I was going through a construction zone. But even though I was seemingly very careful, I still wound up in a hospital bed 
and noticed that my whole left side was damaged. I was disturbed by that and thought I'd had a stroke, but the dream neurologist came by in his white coat and asked me if I had any neurological symptoms, and I said, no, I can move my arm and my leg, and he said, you're fine, go home, and that was the end of the dream, which I found both reassuring that I got the answer at the end that I was fine, but it started with a near-death experience, so I, I usually share my dreams with my wife in the morning, but that one kind of creeped me out, and I did not share it with her. And, and, and if, you, if you look at that dream purely from some of the symbols, uh, often a car or a house will represent uh, a, per, a dreamer's body. And whether you're in the driver's seat means whether you're in control of the process or whether you're in the passenger seat. If you think about my female passenger on the right side, probably representing my, my intuitive self. You know, um, woman's intuition on the right side of the car, and then winding up with damage to the whole left side of my body, which again is sort of the feminine side connected to the right brain. So the left-right thing was pretty important in this whole dream. Then what happened was uh, my wife and I had bought special uh, winter biking gear because we just started biking a few months before, and it was getting cold in December. We we're going to test out our winter biking gear the next morning. We get up after after I had this dream, put the bike uh, gear on, and it dropped into the 30s. And I thought, oh, maybe there's some black ice out there. We better be very careful when we're riding not to wipe out on the ice. So that was the first thing in my mind. And then noticed that, unfortunately, we had uh, summer bike gloves. We hadn't bought any winter bike gloves. So if you know summer bike gloves, they have no fingertips in them. So, so what seemed like a great idea... After two laps, we usually do three laps of our of our cul-de-sac. Uh, my my fingers started getting really cold, and I'd been very careful up to that point. There wasn't any black ice out there. And then, then I uh, had the really brilliant idea of sticking my right hand in my pocket to keep it warm. And going down the last hill, I realized I was going too fast. And if you're a biker, you'll know you never want to squeeze the uh, left front brake pedal alone. Unfortunately, I did, and did that in slow motion, and, and then soon was flying over the handlebars and landing on my left shoulder, my left hip, and my left elbow, and bounced off the asphalt. And I was going through a construction zone on, on, on the road, just like in the dream. And when I got, I bounced right to my feet, and I thought, huh, that dream neurologist said I would be fine. <laughs> I got back on the bike and rode home, even though I was pretty badly bruised. I didn't break any bones, didn't wind up in the ICU. So I was counting my blessings on the way back and pondering the meaning of the dream. Like, why would I have had that experience when I knew I was supposed to be careful and my right brain, which is, you know, supposed to be intuitively taking care of me, uh, seemingly let, let me down. And I started looking at the right brain, right left symbolism. I realized I took my right hand and put it in my pocket, which essentially took my left brain offline. <laughs> my rational mind went out. I quit doing rational things in, on the ride, and then my left hand connected to my right brain, I actually created the accident, which I thought, why would I do that? Uh, <laughs> it seemed pretty stupid to ha make that a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> then I the message was I just turned 60, and I could take a header off a bike and bounce off the ground and walk away without any broken bones. So it was, a, it was really a lesson in resilience, which turned out to be important in the coming year. So yeah, that was a fascinating one of my favorite dreams of all time. <laughs> uh, and, and who knows, maybe it did save your life uh, just by having it in the back of your mind throughout the whole day. Um, mm -hmm. Now, let's. I want to talk a little bit more about a couple of the stories from the book since I have you here. I mean, there's so many great stories, you know, that are inspiring and, and really makes you think, you know, how serious that we need to use dreams as a diagnostic tool. Um, Kat, did you have a personal favorite from the book? Well, I think one of the, the stories that really stuck in my mind a lot was a story that was written by Dr. Kathy Kemper, who's going to actually be sitting on our, our board, uh, or our panel, rather, at the IASD. And she was uh, a pediatrician who dealt with children who had leukemia. And they were very young children, like ages up to nine years of age. And in this one case, this one little child was having a very difficult time uh, with the chemotherapy and her blood counts were not recovering in time for her to have her scheduled 
next chemotherapy, which meant she would have to stay in the hospital longer under quarantine because they're very susceptible to uh, infections after they've had their treatments. And uh, so Kathy was going in early to check on this little girl and she was already sitting up in bed when Kathy came in at like six in the morning and was very happy. And Kathy said, well, why are you so, uh, why are you awake and why are you happy this morning? And she said, because I had a dream last night. And in the dream, there was a thermometer and the mercury in the thermometer was going up, up, up. So I know my blood cell counts are going up. It's amazing how children learn the, the, uh, you know, the, the vocabulary of the hospital. Right. And so, Kathy Kemper is a, is a great uh, dreamer as well. And fortunately, she respected the fact that this child was probably able to interpret her own dreams. Whereas another doctor who may not have been a dreamer would have thought to themselves, hmm, thermometer, mercury going up. This child has popped a fever. Let's immediately get her on uh, IV antibiotics. But Kathy Kemper said, okay, let's let's do a blood test and send it off and let's see what's, what, what's going on. And it turned out that the child's blood cell counts had recovered and she was able to have her next chemotherapy. So it just kind of points out what Dr. Larry Burke and I are saying throughout the book that you are the only one who can truly interpret your dreams. You have your own dream language. And so if there's a snake in a dream, it, two people have the same dream about a snake, they're going to have two different interpretations. So throughout this book, at the end of these stories that uh, that the dreamers put in the book, um, I have my interpretation, which I start with, if this were my dream. But then I look through their dreams for validation that they recognized as well. And that's what I, what, what I focus on. And uh, Dr. Larry Burke has his commentary at the end under, underneath mine. So we're giving both a dreamer's point of view, a patient dreamer's point of view in the interpretation and the doctor's point of view or commentary about that dream patient's dream. And it's absolutely fascinating. That was one of my favorite parts is that you, you took it in from all the different angles. Uh, what about you, Dr. Burke? Was there someone that stuck out in your mind, um, their precognitive dream? The lady with uh, stage four uterine cancer who was 29 years old and had only a 5% chance of surviving, even given the standard chemotherapy at the time. And she had this amazing dream where the silver saucer spaceship landed and the aliens got out and whispered in her ear, you need some interferon. And she'd never heard of that before, but she dutifully made a note and took it into her doctor the next day and said, I think I need some interferon. And the doctor was so shocked that she came up with the name of an experimental drug at the time that, that, no, that she'd certainly never heard of, mm -hmm. that he made sure she got some and she went into remission. And that was 18 years ago. And, and that was part of the healing of her uh, advanced terminal cancer, which was pretty amazing. Wow. I, that's phenomenal. I mean, taking a, a name of an experimental drug out of, you know, the ether. I mean, that's, that's something that you gotta, you know, t take a second look at to say the least. And, and hearing all the stories that you were talking about in your own personal stories, it seems that there are at least some commonalities with symbols and guides. I mean, you, Kat, you were talking about a Franciscan monk. Uh, Larry, you were talking about a dream neurologist. I mean, to me, it sounds, it sounds like almost the same thing, just in, you know, more personal variation of, you know, a guide. And then, you, of course, you had symbols. I mean, do you notice, um, Doctor, have you noticed that there is, what is the most, you know, common symbol of a, of a warning? Do you see, or is it all just, you know, kind of personal? Um, well, I think the most stereotypical warnings about cancer are either, spiders or crabs and there's several stories about spiders in the book and and I, I, at least one about crabs that came from cat's own story but th those are sort of the classic uh symbols and sometimes these archetypal s symbols just uh show up and when they do uh, it doesn't mean that every crab is going to be cancer or every spider is going to be um, cancer but certainly is a, is a great way of getting getting your attention because most people have 
an innate fear of those kinds of things. If you had to guess why, you know, particularly a spider and, uh, is a, you know, a sign for, for cancer, why would you think that? Um, well, I mean, just generally because the ones we most fear are the poisonous ones, and uh, that would be uh, certainly cancer is considered uh, to be uh, a, a poison in, in your life that you need to deal with. So uh, that would be uh, so snakes are another common metaphor, although snakes can have many different meanings in terms of transmuting poisons, uh, shedding your skin, things like that. So, uh, and every Again, every symbol is personal, and one snake may, may mean something to someone else and something totally different to another. It might have to do with the Kundalini energy arising. You know, so. Kat, outside of uh, you know the Franciscan monk, which has been reoccurring in your dreams, is there any one particular symbol that has uh, that you has reoccurred, and and when you see it, you say, "Oh, okay, I need I need to look into this a little bit more." Uh, maybe just when my parents, both of my parents are deceased, if they show up in a dream, um, usually when your parents or a deceased loved one shows up in your dream, it's one of two things. Either you you conjured them up because you missed them so much you really just wanted to see them, or they were given permission to come back to give you a warning. So um, that's, that's usually rings a bell when I see that. Um, that's, uh, you know, with my dreams, uh, mostly those Franciscan monks come in and they speak to me. It's not so much signs and symbols, uh, although I do have a lot of dreams in the books that do have signs and symbols, but those dealt more with healing. They were less precognitive and less diagnostic. Um, I guess it has to do possibly with your personality. I'm not someone who... Uh, 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 believes uh, blindly. I just don't. And so my, in anything, no matter what it is. And so my spirit guides who are the monks realize that they, they kind of got to prove it to me first. And they speak to me just as you and I are speaking right now. Um, and they know that I'm going to check it. I'm going to challenge it. I, just as I challenged with the doctors, but you know, in your question of why do you think that they're monks, I know that when I first wrote my first book, Surviving Cancer Land, Intuitive Aspects of Healing, the, the focus and the message that I wanted the book to have was that modern medicine can go so far, but then comes our higher power, that we don't have to only depend on the modern medicine. It, it does make mistakes, but our higher power doesn't. And so I think that that carried over in this book as well, and the monks showed up. And I mean, they were very helpful with uh, Larry and I getting this book out at, at a remarkable speed and with a great contract and a great publisher. I think you two make such a, a great juxtaposition. Uh, like I said, you, you, know, you got the science and you got the spiritual. And I want to see maybe doctor, the doctor's opinion on, on Kat's side, just on something. You mentioned that how when you see dead ones in your dreams, sometimes it's just because you miss them and, and you want to see them. And other times you said, you mentioned that, no, they're allowed to come back, you know, I guess from the other side is, is what you're saying. Doctor, I mean, what's your opinion on, on that? I mean, I want to see, maybe explore a little bit more of your spiritual side. Do you agree with Kat that, you know, deceased well, ones can come back through dreams or is it more just symbolism? I guess I would have to say that, uh, qualify this by saying I'm also a parapsychologist as well as a radiologist. Right. So, uh, and from the parapsychology point of view, uh, those kind of visitation dreams fall into the category of after-death communication. Dreams are one of the most common forms of after-death communication. And many people find those kinds of dreams very comforting and actually healing uh, for the grieving process. So I'm, and I've had uh, a few of those dreams myself. The, the first one was dreaming of my aunt Betty, who had severe lung disease and emphysema, and one night I had a dream where she appeared younger than her her current age, and said, "Little Betsy is going home now." And I woke up with that the next morning and called my mother and said, uh, "How's aunt, aunt Betty doing?" And she just died that night. So it was that was definitely a, a visitation dream. And then. I asked her if she, anyone ever 
called her Little Betsy, and apparently only her husband had used that nickname, and I would have never heard it. So that was pretty evidential for me that something real had taken place in terms of a visitation. Why she came to me and not to my mother, that's another part of the mystery. I guess she she knew that I was keeping track of my dreams and would pass the message along to my mother. So. <laughs> Uh, in the book, uh, a lot of the dreamers hear their name called during the day or at the end of the dream. What's the significance behind that, Kat? Well, I think that, you know, it's to get your attention. <laughs> you know, <laughs> somebody calls your name, you, you, you know, you're surprised, especially like even in a dream, it, it kind of surprises you. And I call it part of uh, the cocktail, um, the cocktail syndrome theory where if you are awake you're okay so let's just say we go to a cocktail party or we go to any kind of party and there's a lot of ambient noise there's people talking all around you but suddenly somebody all the way across the room talks about your ex it's like your ear you know drops down <laughs> onto the floor and crawls across through all the rooms of people and just comes right up and you're nodding at the people talking to you but you're listening all the way across the room I think the same thing happens in dreams because our spirit guides, our inner guidance, whatever, realizes that if they call our name, they're going to get our attention and we're going to be listening. Well, to say that we're all big advocates of dream journaling would probably be the understatement of the day. Um, but, and it's something that this show has explored in a variety of ways. But I know you got, um, Kat, you have a bit of your own method called So Dream. In a, you know, briefly, tell us a little bit about the, the So Dream method. Well, the so dream is a is an acronym. So what you're going to do is just if if you're having trouble remembering your dreams or you think that you don't dream, even though I'm telling you all the research shows that you do, uh, you're just having trouble remembering it. You can use that acronym to help you bring your dream out of the dream world and into your waking world. So S is to set your intention which is something that, that Larry was talking about earlier. Write it down. What is the question you want answered or what do you want your dream to tell you? And then O is to organize yourself at night before you go to sleep. And Larry has some extra information that, that he can add in later that I think is just brilliant with, with the color of light that you use. But by making sure that you have something beside your bed within reach so you don't really have to move very much, uh, whether you're going to use your smartphone to, to, uh, to tape yourself, to tape your dream, or you're going to use a pencil and paper, or if you're going to draw your dream, whatever you're going to do, have it right there and organized before you go to sleep. And then the D is to dream. Tell yourself you know you dream, and so now you're just going to remember the dream. Set, you know, now you're setting your attention again for a specific thing to dream. E in that is, uh, I'm sorry, R is to remain in your sleep position when you first wake up. That's one of the reasons why so many of us lose our dreams. We hop out of bed. The alarm goes off. We reach over. It bolts us out of our sleep. We turn the alarm off, and then we go, oh, my gosh, I forgot my dream. I was right in the middle of the dream, and I forgot the dream. That's where you want to settle back down into bed in the same position you were in and slide back into that dream. Shut your eyes and slide back into that dream. And that's why it's important to have everything beside your bed so you don't need to move very much. Then when you're ready, very slowly sit up and write down your emotions. The E for emotions refers to those parts of the dreams or snippets that elicit emotion. Like, um, were you happy were you sad when you woke up? Were you breathing really hard? Did you feel like you'd been running? Were you anxious? And then add to that dream memory what colors you saw, what sounds you saw, words, people, animals that we were talking about, plants. Were you in a forest? Um, any symbols, any words? And then M for meaning, underline the most important parts of the snippets that are important to you. Write down what they mean to you, you know, we we're talking about snakes. Does that snake mean something bad? Does it mean the kundalini? Um, does it does it mean you're afraid of being bitten? Do you love snakes? Do you have pet snakes? So write down what they mean for you because that's your dream language, just like the little girl. And then give your dream 
a title because during the day, if you have a daydream and you get more information in the daydream from your night dream, you'll know where to go to put it back into your journal. Hmm. That, that was my favorite part of the method. Uh, I was doing all those other things, but then the title part, um, that was fascinating. I, I never tried that before. Uh, and I definitely want to apply that. Why do you think, why do you think that's so important? The title, like, what does that really add? What layer does that add? Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to that one, Kat, because I'm, I'm going to need to sign off in a minute because I'm getting ready, getting prepared for the, the Rhine Research Center's uh, dream group tonight. And, oh, excellent. And the first thing we do uh, when we're sharing our dreams is, is share our title, because not only is it good for what Kat mentioned is this, being a memory hook to hang your, your dream on and, and recall easily. But when you're sharing in a dream group, it's part of the marketing effort because we only, everyone has a, a dream they want to share, but we don't have time to discuss all of them. So the, usually the person with the sexiest title gets their dream worked on by the group. So it's, it's part of our marketing strategy. <laughs> Uh, and luckily, uh, well, not luckily, I, I could stay with you guys all day. I really only have one more question. So hold on for one more minute because I want to get your angle on this. And then I'll let both of you go at the same time. You know, we've mm -hmm. been talking about how precognitive dreams are, are so important uh, and, uh, and, you know, to detect uh, different diseases. And, and we were focusing on cats, you know, survival and, and your story of breast cancer. So what recommendations, before we go, I always like to try to leave off on a positive note and, and try to get people into action. Um, let's start with you, Larry, then you can hang up and, and we'll, we'll say goodbye after that. What recommendations would you offer to women who offer it about breast cancer? Yeah, I would just say for anybody, uh, just to start keeping a dream diary tonight. It's like all you need is a little composition book. And I usually put, them, again, tomorrow's uh, tomorrow's date and, and my question at the top and the only rule is you can only ask one question a night so you know what question you're getting the answer to in the morning and then I do keep a little red LED battery operated alarm clock near my bed which allows me to look at my dream journal in the middle of the night and not disrupt my pineal melatonin cycle mm -hmm. white light or green light or blue light will disrupt it but red won't so that allows me to see my dream journal so I can write down things and keep track of them. And then uh, it, it, to be persistent, if you need to ask the same question every night for a week, go ahead. If, if you get the answer you're looking for, ask a different one the next night. So, I, And I think that, that that's sort of like your petition to the dream world is to tell them that you're open open for business <laughs> and that, that we're ready to interact with them. And, and then just trust the process and see what you get. What about you, Kat, uh, as, a, as a survivor? What, what, would, what would be your first recommendation to, to offer women who are worried about breast cancer? Well, you know, definitely, like Larry said, you know, you keep a dream journal. And if you have that intuitive hit or those dreams that are telling you that something's wrong, stand in that power and speak your truth in front of the doctor. When you go to the doctor, say, you know, I know something's wrong. Because you have insurance, insurance has already paid for a second test if you need a second test. If you had a mammogram and you're having these nightmares, go back and don't take no for an answer. Be the squeaky wheel and uh, stand in your power. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And everyone, please go get dreams that can save your life, early warning signs of cancer and other diseases. And it showcases the important role of dreams and their power to detect illnesses. You know, maybe you don't know. It, maybe one day it'll save your life. Thank you so much, Kat. I really appreciate your time. Doctor, thank really, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And maybe I'll see you in my dreams tonight. All right. Yeah, that'd be good. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. This is The Mind's Eye. We'll be right back on the wrap-up. Alas, it is time for The Mind's Eye Mummy Wrap-Up. Not only can dreams save your life, but they can inspire you to do bigger and better things. One artist who took inspiration from everywhere... His dreams, his la the landscapes around him, the people he interacted with was Pablo Picasso. Many who art historians consider one of the best artists of all time. Those same art historians also argue if Picasso borrowed actual Ice Age cave art images for his Cubism style, which became the first works of modern art. So who was the real genius here, Picasso or the cavemen? Bernie Taylor, author and naturalist, is going to put the debate to rest as he comes on our next episode, June 21st. Same bad time, same bad schedule, Thursdays, 8 p.m. 
Alas, it is that time for us to sign off. Go to sleep. Sleep is God. Go worship it. We'll be back in a couple weeks. This is The Mind's Eye on Z Talk Radio.